July 8th, 2014, Israel launched a devastating military attack on the Gaza Strip. Over the course of 51 days, the Israeli military dropped nearly 20,000 tons of explosive on Gaza, a densely populated area the size of Philadelphia, killing over 2,000 Palestinians and wounding tens of thousands more. The overwhelming majority of these casualties were civilians. This strip of land is being bombarded from the air, sea and land. Israel launched at least 160 strikes on the Gaza Strip. And there's one less hospital in Gaza now. Israel today flattened Wafa Hospital. The sheer scale of the attack sparked outrage and condemnation around the world. Israel's month-long pounding of Gaza shocked many people around the world. Mass demonstrations have been held in many of the world's major cities. But in the United States, the story was different. Polls showed the American people holding firm in their support for Israel. This is the latest CNN ORC poll of Americans shows 57% of those polls say Israel's action in Gaza is justified, 34% say unjustified. These numbers were striking, but they weren't new. Over the course of a conflict in which Palestinian casualties have far outnumbered Israeli casualties, the American people have consistently shown far more sympathy for Israelis than for Palestinians. It's very difficult to divorce public opinion on any question from the media coverage that people rely on to form opinions. And I think the most prevalent lesson from looking at the coverage is that the coverage tends to see this conflict from the Israeli side. Study after study has demonstrated that Israeli perspectives dominate American media coverage. So by far the most common thing we've heard is that everything comes down to Israel's right to defend itself. Israel is a state that implements its right to defend itself and its citizens. It is a talking point that is set from the top, and by the top I mean from the highest officials, government officials, who are commenting on this issue which the media obsessively covers and repeats. A man's got to do what a man's got to do, and you say a country's got to do what a country's got to do. We have to defend ourselves. In the uh, most recent war uh, in 2014, when we looked at mainstream media outlets, almost by a margin of, of three to one, Israeli spokespeople overrepresented compared to Palestinian spokespeople. So almost every time you turned on the screen, there was a Israeli representative on the screen telling you Israel is the one that's in a position of defense. It is being attacked. And basically Israel is saying, hey, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that if rockets fly on your head, you are allowed to defend yourself. Add to this the fact that you have American elected officials also reinforcing Israel's right to defend itself. As I've said many times, Israel has a right to defend itself against rocket and tunnel attacks from Hamas. And what gets pushed out of the frame entirely is the fact now that for almost 50 years, Palestinians have been systematically dispossessed from their land and denied their most basic human rights. Pioneers and refugees from countries of the oppression, young and old, they are going now to a land which accepts them. They will march to their work in the Jewish settlements to build roads, to quarry stones. They will drill wells to restore to Palestine's soil its long neglected fruitfulness. Zionism, the nationalist movement that emerged in Europe in the late 1800s, was dedicated to the idea that the Jewish people after centuries of living as persecuted minorities within other countries, were entitled to a state in historic Palestine, the biblical homeland of the Jews more than 3,000 years before. But there was a basic problem with the choice from the start. Palestine was already home to hundreds of thousands of Palestinian Arabs who had been living in Palestine for centuries. After World War II and the Holocaust, the situation reached a breakpoint. Ultimately, the British colonial government made the decision to withdraw and to pass the problem on to the newly created United Nations. In 1947, UN Resolution 181 recommended that Palestine be split into two parts. Jews, who were a third of the population, would receive 56% of the land. Palestinians, who were two-thirds of the population and possessed more than 90% of historic Palestine, would receive 44%. 
These terms were immediately rejected by Arab leaders as unfair, but in the spring of 1948, Zionist leaders declared Israel a state along the proposed borders anyway, triggering the first Arab-Israeli war. Arab armies set out to destroy the newly born nation, but suffered repeated defeats. After winning a crushing victory, Israel took possession of even more land. By the time armistice was declared in 1949, Israel controlled 78% of historic Palestine. The creation of the new state would be celebrated by Israelis as a triumph. But to this day, it is commemorated by Palestinians as the Nakba, the Arabic term for the catastrophe, in memory of the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who were driven from their homes to make way for the new Jewish state. All told, approximately 700,000 people, more than half of Palestine's native population were uprooted there is a lot of sympathy that can be generated, and I think rightly so, for what Jewish people as a whole have dealt with in Western societies and, and globally because of anti-Semitism. The question then becomes, um, what is the proper response to that? The Zionist answer is, of course, statehood. And there's many people who would sympathize with that if it was, in fact, done in a vacuum and if it was, in fact, done for a people without a land in a land without people. The reality is that's just not the way that it happened. There were people here. They lost their homes, their livelihood, their nation, their everything. This was a land in 1910 that was 93% Palestinian Arab and 6 7% Jewish. How did it suddenly become 80% Jewish and 20% Palestinian? This was not a normal demographic transition. This was a consequence of Israel's desire to create a Jewish state, and to do that, it had to get rid of as many Palestinians as possible. The Palestinians used the term catastrophe to speak of the 1948 consequences when they lost their land the first time around. In 67, it was another Nakba, another catastrophe. In June of 1967, Israel won what was perceived as a stunning underdog victory over much larger Arab armies during the Six-Day War. With victory, in addition to taking land from Egypt and Syria, Israel began to militarily occupy all remaining Palestinian territory in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. Suddenly, all of Palestine is now lost. We now had no Palestinian land left under Palestinian control. You had a huge Palestinian population living as refugees or living under occupation. Palestinians are governed under military law. They are essentially prisoners. They are treated as if they were all prisoners of war. They have no rights. In the immediate aftermath of the 67 war, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 242. Citing international law forbidding the takeover of territory by war, 242 explicitly called for Israel to withdraw its armed forces. But to this day, Israel has largely failed to comply, not only holding Palestinian territory, but confiscating additional land and building massive Jewish settlement blocks in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, in direct violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which expressly forbids states from transferring civilian populations into territory it occupies. In addition, Israel has established an entire matrix of security control on Palestinian land to secure these settlements, including checkpoints that prevent Palestinians from traveling freely within their own land, and a 440-mile security wall along the Israeli border that cuts into Palestinian territory. If you're one of the millions of Palestinians living under occupation, this is what the conflict is about. But one of the most stunning things is how this side of the story basically just drops out. And instead, you hear over and over again that it's Israel that's surrounded. Israel is surrounded. Israel, surrounded. Surrounded. It's Israel that's under siege and under threat. You described a very small landmass. Mm. And, you know, you're dealing with Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran. And, it's a uh, tough neighborhood. It's, it's, a, it's a tough neighborhood. The imagery here is so powerful that it's almost impossible to have a rational discussion about the legitimate grievances of Palestinians. Hamas is a terror group, and it is uh, committed to killing Jews and wiping Israel off the face of the earth. That's not debatable. That's a fact. And none of this is by accident. It's the result of a deliberate effort to shape American perceptions of the conflict, a propaganda effort that really begins to take shape 
with Israel's invasion of Lebanon in 1982. Israel unleashed another massive air attack on Palestinian guerrilla targets in Lebanon today. From the sky, the howl of Israeli jets, bombing and bombing. In the summer of 1982, Israel invaded neighboring Lebanon in an attempt to drive the Palestinian Liberation Organization out of its encampments on the southern border with Israel. What's an Israeli army doing here in Beirut? The answer is that we are now dealing with an imperial Israel, which is solving its problems in someone else's country. World opinion be damned. The Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982 was a watershed. It was Israel breaking out beyond its immediate region to aggressively attack another country. And it was a bit of a shock to many people. In the interests of self-defense, that gallant little underdog Israel has suddenly started behaving like the neighborhood bully. By the time the war was over, the Israeli military would kill 17,000 Lebanese and Palestinians and wound another 30,000, almost all of them civilians. In West Beirut, hospitals are so taxed with the injured that they have become specialized. This center takes only burn victims of phosphorus shells. Shrapnel cases, concussions, and fractures are directed to other facilities. And just a few months later, American media coverage would take an even darker turn. There's been another horrendous turn of events in the Middle East. Hundreds of men, women, and children, perhaps as many as a thousand people in all, have been massacred in two Palestinian refugee camps in West Beirut. Israel's Lebanese allies, operating with the consent of the Israeli government, had massacred several thousand Palestinian civilians in the refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila, and American news media had the pictures to prove it. By all appearances, groups of men had been ordered to stand against the wall and then gunned down in cold blood. Today, Palestinians searched frantically for relatives. They took our children, one said. They're killing our families. This was a game changer in terms of how Israel was going to deal with the question of publicity. They went on the offensive for the first time. All the direct or implicit accusations that the IDF bear any blame whatsoever for this human tragedy in the Shatila camp are entirely baseless and without any foundation. The government of Israel rejects them with the contempt which they deserve. Two years after the Lebanon invasion, the American Jewish Congress sponsored a conference in Jerusalem to devise a formal public relations strategy known in Hebrew as Hasbara. Participants included PR and advertising executives, media specialists, journalists, and leaders of major Jewish groups. The primary aim of the conference was to develop strategies to spin unpopular Israeli policies and to counter negative press coverage by shaping the media frame in advance. News doesn't just jump into a camera, a conference delegate said. It's directed, it's managed, it's made accessible. Israel-based advertising executive Martin Fenton would put it in even more blunt terms. Propaganda is not a dirty word, he said. Face it, we are in the game of changing people's minds, of making them think differently. To accomplish that, we need propaganda. After Lebanon, you start to see the basic Hasbro strategy in action. Images of Palestinians fighting back against Israel's occupation make their way onto American television screens and the Israeli military crushes this resistance in brutal ways that undercut Israel's image as underdog and victim. Israeli helicopter gunships deliberately fired a missile into a crowd of civilians last night, killing seven Palestinians and wounding 70 more. Then Israeli officials go into full Hasbara mode and act like the occupation doesn't even exist, framing all Palestinian resistance as terrorism and Israeli aggression as self-defense. The Palestinian terror campaign continues. It only justifies again and again that we, Israel, have to continue and defend ourselves. And so this becomes the framing of the situation. Israel is defending itself, which means Israel is not the aggressor here. That doesn't square with the reality on the ground, and we know that. You have a right to defend yourself. You don't have a right to occupy people, deny them their human rights, and then cry foul when they resist. That's not the right to self-defense. That's the right to repression. That's what Israel is asking for here. Let us do away 
with these dissenters, these Palestinian dissenters, and call it defense. And when you look today at how the media cover the conflict, you see just how successful Israel's propaganda has been in reversing the legacy of Lebanon. If there's any complaints, uh, and there should be, about civilian deaths, they, they belong. The responsibility and the blame belongs in one place, Hamas. I don't think anyone should get that wrong. The Israeli position is the first position. They are allowed to, to determine the narrative, determine the facts on the ground. Hamas is a terror organization committed to our destruction. They fire thousands of rockets at our cities. The dominant narrative in the media coverage then is Israel is retaliating for an attack it has suffered. Israel says the barrage of rockets is in retaliation to the 750 rockets fired from Gaza. We know this is all retaliation for Hamas firing rockets into Israel which is the dominant media story of our time. What we've seen is really another kind of occupation, an occupation of American media and what we could call the American mind by a pro-Israel narrative that's deflected attention away from what virtually everyone recognizes as the best way to resolve this conflict, end the occupation and the settlements so that Palestinians can finally have a state of their own. His Excellency Yitzhak Rabin, Prime Minister of Israel, the President of the United States. The ongoing peace process that began with the Oslo Peace Accords in 1993 was designed to negotiate the terms of Israel's withdrawal from Palestinian territory in accordance with UN Resolution 242, which made an explicit connection between Israeli withdrawal and a just and lasting peace. But since Oslo, Israel has actually taken more Palestinian land for its Jewish-only settlements. In 1993, there were approximately 200,000 illegal Jewish settlers living in the occupied Palestinian territories. Since then, that number has more than tripled, with approximately 650,000 settlers now living in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. So if you look at the result, not the words and the pretty phrases. What's happened over the past 20 years and was inaugurated at Oslo was not a peace process. It was an annexation process. What has happened is that now one in 11 Israeli Jews live in these illegal settlements. So the failure to confront the settlement enterprise from the very beginning, I think, has created a almost insuperable obstacle uh, to the creation of a Palestinian state. There's no place to put it. What we're, we're talking about here is something that is completely indefensible. Israel knows this. Israel knows this very well. And for that reason, wants to talk about anything and everything else. They'd rather talk about terrorism. They'd rather talk about security. We're willing to make great concessions for peace. But there is something that I will never compromise on, and that's Israel's security. The reason they've been able to so effectively change the subject isn't because they're practicing some kind of mass mind control. The main reason is that the US government itself has had a vested interest in promoting this same narrative for almost 50 years now. This goes back to the start of the so-called special relationship with Israel in the late 1960s, when the US decides to deputize Israel and make it what the Nixon administration called a cop on the beat to protect American interests in the Middle East, especially US energy supplies. Ever since, the American government has continued to give Israel roughly $3 billion a year in military aid, while also vetoing one UN resolution after another, condemning the occupation and settlements. The challenge is to make sure that the American people stay on board with US aid, despite what Israel is doing. A number of well-funded public relations organizations have emerged within the United States to help Israel justify its policies, especially the occupation and settlements, on security grounds. One of these groups is the Israel Project. In 2009, the Israel Project turned to conservative pollster and rebranding expert Frank Luntz to determine which talking points used by Israeli and US officials over time have been most effective in maintaining American sympathy for Israel. Luntz wrote up his recommendations in a 2009 report called the Global Language Dictionary. If you want to understand how the propaganda works, especially in the US, you need to read the Luntz document. He's really clear that the occupation and especially the settlements are a problem. And he points to polls that show a large majority of Americans actually think that Israel should retreat to the 67 borders. In fact, he says, when you talk about land in terms of 67, you completely flip American sentiment against you. But, and this is his solution, if you bring up the danger of terrorism, you win back the support.
The key, Lund says, is to claim that the fight is over ideology, not land, about terror, not territory. In fact, these three words, terror, not territory, summarize the basis of the propaganda campaign in the US. And Lund goes on to say that one of the most effective ways to make the conflict about terrorism is to refer to an obscure political document written in 1988 by a small group of ideologues, the Hamas Charter, that calls for the destruction of Israel. Even though the Hamas leadership effectively disowned the Charter a long time ago, it's been PR gold for Israel. Lunt's research has discovered that when Americans hear the words of the Charter, Israel goes from bully to victim, and sympathy for the plight of the Palestinians dissipates. So, he says, don't just quote it, read it out loud again and again. And his advice has been taken up, often hysterically, by Israel's advocates. The Hamas Charter not only calls for Israel's destructions, ladies and gentlemen, Article 7 calls for the murder of every Jew. It calls for the murder of every Jew. It's a Nazi document. We have the Israeli prime minister saying movements like Hamas that are national movements are the same thing as ISIS. Hamas is like ISIS. Hamas is like Al-Qaeda. Hamas is like Hezbollah. Hamas is like Boko Haram. And they are completely not the same thing. Hamas is as much a nationalist movement uh, as it is an, a religious movement. And in fact, it, it often assigns priority to its nationalist goals over its religious goals. This false notion that Hamas is part of this Al-Qaeda network is not bought even by important elements of the American military. In 2010, the United States Central Command, or CENTCOM, the highest military command in the US, issued a classified report that questioned the current US policy of isolating and marginalizing Hamas as well as Hezbollah in Lebanon. The report described the two groups as pragmatic and argued that putting them and Al-Qaeda in the same sentence as if they're all the same is just stupid. And the US military isn't alone in this assessment. ISIS itself has attacked Hamas again and again because they're not radical enough. They're too pragmatic and too compromising. I spent a lot of time on my radio program going over Hamas's charter, what it says. It wants to obliterate Israel. It wants to destroy the Jews. It is a sick, twisted, you know, perverted ideology, and it, it manifests itself in different forms. Muslim Brotherhood, Islamic Jihad, uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, you know, it's all the same thing. Meanwhile, you hear next to nothing about another extreme political charter that has much more relevance to the conflict, the platform of the ruling Likud party in Israel. The Hamas Charter not only calls for Israel's destructions, ladies and gentlemen, it calls for the murder of every Jew. It's a Nazi document. Meanwhile, you hear next to nothing about another extreme political charter that has much more relevance to the conflict, the platform of the ruling Likud party in Israel. Well, if you look at the language that's in that charter, the Likud charter, it flatly rejects, quote, flatly rejects the existence of a Palestinian state anywhere, anywhere on that side of the Jordan River. In other words, completely denying the right of a state of Palestine to exist. That's far more relevant to have language like the language in the Likud Charter be in the charter of a party that is the largest in an Israeli government, driving an Israeli state, and has the capacity to act upon the words in their charter in a way that no other party does. To strengthen the case that the conflict is about terrorism and not territory, Luntz points to the effectiveness of another well-established Israeli talking point, the claim that Israel gave up control of Gaza in 2005 in hopes of achieving peace and a two-state solution and got only rockets in return. We left Gaza completely. Mm -hmm. We had Gaza, they could have turned it into a flourishing, wonderful place to live in. Look at what they did. They turned it into a haven of terrorists coming from all over the world. It's completely untrue that Israel left the, the Gaza Strip. They did withdraw their colonists, but at the same time, they tighten their control over the Gaza Strip. This is Gaza's main freight route into Israel. And normally this road would be bumper to bumper with heavily laden trucks. 
but it's completely closed, as is every other border crossing in the country. Nothing's coming into Gaza, and nothing is getting out. So the idea that Israel left is 100% bogus. Gaza remains occupied. Who can come and go is totally at the Israeli discretion. In Gaza, there are constant military attacks by the Israeli Air Force, by drones. Targeted assassinations go on all the time. It wasn't really a withdrawal, but the conventional shorthand in the media is that Israel was willing to give up an enormous amount to the Palestinian side, and the Palestinians responded with violence. Israel, for, since 1967, controlled Gaza. They gave it to the Palestinians in a gesture of peace, and all they got are a bunch of rockets so in return. Israel... This is the basic frame of Israel's PR campaign. Make sure the media stays focused on terrorism and Hamas extremism as a source of the conflict, not the occupation and the settlements. If you want to see this in operation, just look at the coverage of any of Israel's many attacks on Gaza over the past few years. The scale and intensity of this attack was surprising. The deadliest operation against Palestinians in decades. After an intense three-week assault, 1,300 dead, 5,000 wounded. In late December of 2008, Israel launched Operation Cast Lead, a massive ground and air assault on the Gaza Strip. The Air Force released this cockpit video. Over a period of three weeks, the Israeli military dropped over 600 tons of bombs on Gaza. It isn't clear yet how many civilians are among the... Nearly 1,400 Palestinians were killed and thousands more injured. The wounded were carried on corrugated iron, in private cars, on backs, and in arms. The worst one-day casualty toll in Gaza anybody can remember. Normally in a conflict, civilians can run for their lives. Gaza was one of the few, if not the only, modern conflict where the helpless civilians who were subjected to massive technologically advanced firepower by the Israelis had no escape routes. With Gaza City bombed and burning, Palestinians heeded Israel's warning to get out of the way, but found they had nowhere to go. It was a brutal, murderous attack, devastating. Uh, this attack was murderous. If you asked any American why that war started, they would say because the Palestinians started, you know, firing rockets at Israel. What are the goals of that operation right now? To change totally the behavior of the Hamas. It's a terrorist uh, uh, regime that keeps shelling Israel with thousands of uh, rockets and uh, motor shells. What this forgets is that for the latter half of 2008, there was a very successful ceasefire that curtailed rocket fire into Israel dramatically, almost to the point at which there was none. This was shattered in November of 2008 when Israel attacked what they said was a tunnel building project, killed six Hamas militants. At that point, the ceasefire was off. When Hamas resumed rocket attacks after Israel broke the ceasefire, Israeli officials went on American television and got away with blaming Hamas for breaking the ceasefire. You know, it was Hamas that unilaterally tore up the ceasefire understandings. It was Hamas that escalated the violence that reached a crescendo on Christmas Day when we had in one 24-hour period some 80 rockets, mortar shells and missiles coming into Israel attacking our civilians. Now, we want to work with the Palestinian government. And the lie was then repeated uncritically by U.S. news media. James, there's no question here, is there, that Hamas started this? Well, look, I don't think Israel uh, had any choice. It was a ceasefire that was broken by Hamas. They fired something like 300 rockets into Israel. Uh, I mean, this is an act of war. What are they supposed to do? Just compare this to how media outside the U.S. dealt with this. Isn't it the fact that during the ceasefire, not a single Israeli was killed? And the reason for that was because Hamas fired not a single rocket. No, I think you're uh, wrong, unfortunately, because during that ceasefire of six months, they were firing rockets on a daily basis. On Channel 4 in Britain, you saw an anchor presenting evidence that the Israeli government itself acknowledged that Hamas observed the ceasefire. This is actually a document that's given to journalists by the Israeli government. And in this document, it says, and I'm quoting, Hamas was careful to maintain the ceasefire. Um, Israel officially recognizes that until it broke the ceasefire, Hamas didn't fire a single rocket. I mean, the propaganda is so powerful that these truisms literally truisms, are almost inexpressible. The lesson is that 
this conflict started when we say it started. And we say it started when Israel was attacked. In 2012, and again in 2014, Israel launched two more devastating attacks on Gaza. Polls once again showed that Americans remained firmly on Israel's side. Israel can saturate the media with its spokespeople, but there's still the problem of massive Palestinian casualties showing up on television screens. Here again, the Luntz document spells out which talking points have been most effective in spinning the brutal reality of Palestinian casualties. He says the first thing the pro-Israeli spokespeople should do is to express empathy for the innocent victims. Unfortunately, innocents do get hurt, and we, we really grieve that. We're sad for every civilian casualty. The entire situation is, is tragic. Then, Luntz tells PR spokespeople to turn the tables and ask the American people, what would you do? So what would you do in the United States? Can you imagine um, what America would do if it were facing a similar threat? We always try to ask you the question we ask ourselves. What will you do? What would you do? What would you do if more than 3,000 rockets had been fired on your cities? What would you do? 3,000 rockets. What would you do? If terrorists were tunneling under your frontier? What would you do if three kids are kidnapped because of a tunnel network? What sort of question is this? Of course, anybody would act to defend themselves against unprovoked aggression, but it is a question that is completely devoid of any context. Then on top of that, when massive numbers of Palestinian civilians predictably die from Israeli attacks, Israel claims it's part of a deliberate Hamas strategy to drum up sympathy. They use telegenically dead Palestinians for their cause. They want the more dead, the better. So they end up in this upside-down Orwellian world where Israelis killing civilians becomes an unforgivable transgression against Israelis. It is hard to come away with any feeling but that we are in the midst of a world gone mad. Last week, I found a quote of many years ago by Golda Meir, one of Israel's early leaders, which might have been said yesterday. We can forgive the Arabs for killing our children, she said, but we can never forgive them for forcing us to kill their children. It's not difficult to imagine Americans identifying with Palestinians who are suffering, but they need to be able to see that suffering on their television screens and in their newspapers. Israel said today its new offensive is targeting terrorists. And when your sense of the coverage is that there's something that these people did to deserve this, or that they are affiliated with terrorists and terrorist-minded governments, the fallout of that is an inability to identify with people who are suffering in far greater numbers and in far greater proportion than their Israeli counterparts. The effort to shape American perceptions of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been taken up by a number of pro-Israel groups based in the US. Together, these groups are commonly referred to as the Israel Lobby. Nowhere has the lobby's power to shape a pro-Israel narrative been more visible than in the U.S. Congress, due largely to the efforts of one of the most influential lobbying groups working on Capitol Hill today, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, better known as APEC. It is great to see so many good friends from all across the country. I see more than 10,000 people young and old. APAC's annual conference draws nearly 10,000 attendees from around the country, including the most influential members of both houses of Congress from both parties. It would be very hard for ordinary Americans to know that they're being deceived, uh, that, uh, that some very uh, competent uh, experts at spin management are, in fact, deluding them. Um, there are many reasons for this. Uh, one of them is that the American political class has basically swallowed the line, hook, line, and sinker. They keep getting rocket attack after rocket attack, and then they're criticized for human rights uh, uh, problems because they defend themselves. This is particularly true for Republicans. They're responding, Mr. Speaker, to attacks on their civilian population. I mean, what is it that they want? Well, we know what they want. They want Israel obliterated from the map, Mr. Speaker. But it's also true for many Democrats. We stand with our ally. We stand with the democratic state of Israel. We stand against 
terrorism. This administration will always stand up for Israel's right to defend itself. They made the mistake of actually leaving AIPAC's facts address on one bill that was actually laid before Congress. And of course, nobody was apparently embarrassed. The fact that AIPAC writes the legislation for them or writes their speeches for them doesn't seem to in the least bother people. There's nothing happening here that's secret or under the table. It's not a cabal. It's not a conspiracy. It is, in fact, domestic politics the way it's practiced here in the United States. There are roughly three dozen or so pro-Israel PACs that give money. Over the last 15 or 20 years, they've given 55, 60 million dollars in American elections. There are one or two Arab American PACs, and I believe last time I looked, they'd given, you know, 800,000 to a million. So you've got $55 million of PAC contributions on one side, and you've got maybe a million at most on the other side. The actual views of most people in the American Jewish community, according to every poll, diverge greatly from the extreme right-wing neoconservative views of the entire establishment leadership of that community. Most people in the Jewish community are much more liberal. Uh, they're against settlement, they're against occupation, they want a two-state solution. And there are some key elements of what we call the Israel lobby that aren't Jewish, so-called Christian Zionists. Evangelical Christians in America have become Israel's staunchest ally in an increasingly hostile world. In the United States, uh, roughly a third of the population uh, believes that every word of the Bible is literally true. If the Bible is literally true, then the land of Israel was promised to the Jews by God, and they have every right to take it over from the usurpers. Listen closely, those of you who are listening in the liberal media. The Jewish people are not occupying the land of Israel. They own the land of Israel. One of the problems with the influence the Israel lobby has in the United States now is it has been hard for government officials to have an honest discussion. Just look what happened to President Obama when he made the mistake of simply saying out loud what the international consensus is. We believe the borders of Israel and Palestine should be based on the 1967 lines with mutually agreed swaps so that secure and recognized borders are established for both states. It didn't matter that Obama was just repeating what had been official U.S. policy for decades or the right-wing president Ronald Reagan had said essentially the same thing in the 1980s in even stronger language. UN Resolution 242 remains wholly valid as the foundation stone of America's Middle East peace effort. It is the United States position that in return for peace, the withdrawal provision of Resolution 242 applies to all fronts, including the West Bank and Gaza. When Obama said it, he was immediately accused by right-wing groups of setting up Israel for another Holocaust. Has President Obama abandoned Israel? After strong support by 11 consecutive American presidents, it appears Obama has moved sharply toward Israel's enemies, and the results could be disastrous. The leader of Hezbollah has vowed to finish the job Hitler started. Up till now, America's strong backing of Israel made that impossible. But with Obama's waffling, could a second Holocaust be on the way? No, it's a pretty ingenious tactic. How are you supposed to have a rational discussion about the occupation when pro-Israel extremists call the 67 borders the Auschwitz borders? No Auschwitz borders! These are the two alternatives. You're either going to be in Auschwitz or you support Israel. Because Israel was in fact created in the wake of the Holocaust, it isn't that extraordinary that the two would be linked that way. I have a problem with the idea of exploiting the link and using those six million Jews and almost, in my mind, it's like saying Anne Frank would, would want the occupation to continue. We are a nation that rose from the ashes of the Holocaust. When we say never again, we mean never again. I see a lot of manipulation here about the victimhood of Israeli Jews, the sense of victimhood. And I'm a child of survivors, Holocaust survivors, so I'll be the last one to underestimate the importance of history and the history of persecution of Jews in the Israeli-Palestinian context. But does it mean that Jews now in Israel go every day and think about Auschwitz? I doubt it. There are watchdog groups that keep track of what different media organizations publish or broadcast, and if they're not happy about it, they either publish their own attacks, they organize consumer boycotts. The media outlets don't see the pushback from the other side. They don't see the upside to standing up 
for, uh, for their own reporting. So I think in most cases they cave. Look at how American media covered Israel's 2014 attack on Gaza. A keyword search of all the major networks showed that over the course of the 51-day assault, Israel's ongoing military siege and blockade of Gaza were barely mentioned compared to the thousands of times Hamas rocket attacks on Israel were mentioned. But the silence of mainstream media across the board on these issues uh, yeah, hasn't stopped right-wing pro-Israel advocates um, with zero evidence making exactly the opposite claim, that the U.S. news media bends over backwards to humanize Palestinians while demonizing Israel. Consistently, the Times has suppressed any story that would portray Israel sympathetically. And of course, there's no greater weapon in the attack arsenal than equating critical coverage of Israel's policies with anti-Semitism. Any fair-minded person who follows Al Jazeera knows it's anti-American and anti-Semitic. You're, Jew, you're a Jewish that. man, correct? Yes, I am. It doesn't, it doesn't come more anti-Semitic than Al Jazeera. Uh, I, they, would, they, would, they would do violence uh, to you. Who and who? A journalist at Al Jazeera would do violence? people that run that the, network would, they would do, do violence, violence to you. I hardly think so. Abba Eben wrote an article in which he explained to American Jews what their task was. Their task is to show that anyone who's a critic of Zionism by which he means a critic of the policies of the state of Israel, must be either an anti-Semite or a neurotic, self-hating Jew. That covers 100% of possible criticism. So it used to be that I was always called a self-hating Jew, and, and everybody like me was called a self-hating Jew. I am now not only a self-hating Jew, but they also call me an anti-Semite. How I, with my four Jewish grandparents, I'm still an anti-Semite. My wife was born in a displaced persons camp in Germany, and I'm an anti-Semite. Look, I've done uh, dozens of interviews which begin from the terrorism departure point. But when given an opportunity to actually speak and present a different perspective, that can dissolve rather quickly. Is Hamas a terrorist organization? Do I get to actually speak now? You get to point? answer the question. It's a simple yes or no question. Is Sir, Hamas uh, you invited me on here? Is Hamas, whose charter calls for the destruction of Israel, is that a terrorist organization? That's a yes or no thank, question. Thank you for your question. Finally. It's very telling to me that, and it should be telling to your viewers as well. By the way, that the moment you have a Palestinian voice on your program, who begins to explain the legitimate grievances of Palestinians on the ground, a not just organization. Hamas. Answer. Sir, let me f Sir, answer let the me question. Finish. What part of this can't you get through your thick head? I think is I, Hamas a terrorist excuse me? organization? Excuse yes me? or no? The only thing that you're going to say is what we want you to say, and if you don't say it, we're not going to let you speak. Our media operations, national media, is a scandal when it comes to Israel. I look at the UK with all its deficit, and there's a real debate. For example, there's this anchor called Jon Snow, Channel 4 in the UK, and he interviewed Mark Regev, and he grilled him with questions, grilled him. Mark Regev, how does killing children on a beach contribute to that purpose? What was the point of bombing the El Wafa hospital, for goodness sake? There are grave uncertainties no, no. about whether you are acting within no, the I, law. I, I oh, disagree. Yes. Oh, yes. You are deliberately no, targeting neighborhoods in which you no, know there no, are no. women and children. You've tried everything with Gaza. You've besieged it for seven years. The people live an intolerable and ghastly life, and you know that better than anybody. Why don't you try one other thing? Talking. Why not talk? Why not be brave and talk directly with them? Why not? I can never see this in America. I've never seen anything like this in the United States. While the mainstream propaganda system is operating the same as it always has, there are definite signs that its control is starting to unravel. Over just the past few years, the proliferation of social media and internet news sources has made it increasingly difficult for the Israeli government and pro-Israel groups in the US to manage American perceptions of the conflict. Video footage and reporting from the ground bearing witness to the reality of the occupation are now more accessible than ever on the internet. At the same time, a powerful new movement has been gaining momentum and raising awareness of the occupation. While activists from the Black Lives Matter movement have been making explicit connections between police violence against African Americans, and the Israeli military's repression of Palestinians. We stand next to people who continue to courageously struggle and resist the occupation. People continue to dream and fight for freedom. From Ferguson to Palestine, the struggle for freedom continues. And all of these developments seem to be having an effect 
Polls now show that while sympathy for Israel remains at all-time highs among older Americans, it has been hemorrhaging among young people. Despite the efforts of the lobby, something really striking is taking place. And pro-Israel operatives like Frank Luntz are in a panic. In his latest report, he calls what's happening with young people a disaster. Hey, hey! Oh, oh! The siege of has got to go! As the discourse begins to open, more people are starting to understand this as a rights-based issue, not an issue of radicalism. This is a movement for the rights of people whose rights are being denied, who are living under occupation, who want to live in their country freely, just like anybody else. Let's just get away from the mythologies and talk about the realities, and then maybe be able to persuade people that they should not any longer give their unwavering support to a nation engaged in a policy that's not just inhumane and, and brutal, but ultimately suicidal. Given the central role that the United States plays in backing Israel, it seems to me Americans, all Americans, have a right to question particular Israeli policies, and in particular, the prolonged occupation, the fact that the Palestinian people have been kept without a state and without any political rights for decades now. In the end, this comes down to a battle for the minds of the American people, a battle over the stories they're told to make sense of this conflict, a battle over perception. The more Americans are able to see the reality of occupation with their own eyes, to see images of routine daily violence, of the repression and humiliation that never make their way into mainstream news, the more they'll question the image of Israel as this tiny little David up against the bullying Arab Goliath and start to wonder if it's actually the outgunned Palestinians who might be the real Davids here. When that starts becoming the dominant perception here in the US, all bets are off. It all comes down to American public perception.